Hi, it's Katrina. Terracotta Army Surface Chromium. Going on four decades now, scientists have held the belief that 2,000 years ago, the Chinese developed a highly advanced chromate conversion technology for preventing metal corrosion. It all has to do with the legendary Terracotta Army, discovered in the tomb of the first Chinese emperor. When researchers looked at the bronze weapons buried with the warriors, they found traces of chromium, which they believed was responsible for the preservation of the weapons. But that's not the case at all. A recent analysis of the weapons and the soil from the tomb revealed that there was no chromium on the weapons. It all came from the soil itself. This means the Chinese did not come up with a superior anti-rust treatment after all. The only reason these weapons are so well preserved after being buried for over 2,000 years is because of moderately alkaline pH levels in the soil. It's natural, not some wild invention from the Chinese. Still, the Terracotta Army isn't without its mystery. This fantastic army of life-size ceramic figures was discovered in three gigantic pits completely by accident, buried in the mausoleum of Qin Shi Huang. He was the first emperor of unified China, living between 259 and 210 BC. And while over 2,000 ceramic warriors have been found already, scientists believe there could be thousands more. They just haven't found them yet. There is also the mystery of the remains of the emperor himself. They still haven't been found, and the government is making sure that nobody disturbs his peace, since after all, it is a sacred site. The Barabar Caves The Barabar Hill Caves are considered the oldest surviving man-made caves in India. And that's saying something considering how ancient the subcontinent is and how much history is hidden across its majestic mountains and valleys. The Barabar Caves date back to about 322 BC, at the beginning of the Maurya Empire. They can be found today in Jehanabad, which is near the major town of Gaia. The region has several caves. There's the Lomas Rishi Cave with its impressive arch and the exquisitely carved elephants in the doorway. There's the Sudama Cave, which was dedicated to the great Mauryan Emperor Ashoka in 261 BC. The Karan Chaupar Cave was dug out of the earth specifically to house Buddhist monks. There has been no evidence found that monks actually lived here, and there has been little evidence found that anyone lived in any of the caves. One of the weirdest things about the caves here is that most aren't actually finished, and none of them seems to have had any purpose. It was a lot of work to make these caves by hand, then to just give up before they were finished and leave them empty. Scientists do not know what Ashoka was thinking when he commissioned the caves. The Mysterious Sword Inscription a sword from the 13th century was pulled out of the River Witham in the United Kingdom back in 1825. It is housed at the British Museum and looks pretty ordinary at first sight. This sword weighs only two pounds and was made of raw steel, double-edged, and with a hilt shaped like a cross. But the design of the sword isn't what has scientists stumped. It's the inscription made on the blade in gold wire, inlaid directly in the steel. The inscription has never been deciphered. It's a random group of letters that appears to have no meaning at all. According to the British Library, the code is completely incomprehensible. Nobody knows if it's a magical incantation that was supposed to imbue the wielder of the weapon with mystical abilities, or if it was a religious blessing, or simply the signature of the master forger who created the weapon. For over a hundred years, this inscription has mystified researchers and stumped even the most skilled code breakers. What does this odd group of letters mean? Nobody knows for sure, but the British Library recently posted information about the weapon on its website, along with an invitation for readers to help crack the apparently unbreakable code. What do you think the code could mean? Let me know in the comments below. The Megaliths of the Yangshan Quarry In the year 1405, Emperor Zhu Di ruled the Ming Dynasty. He had just taken the throne from his father, the founder, Zhu Yuanjing. Because the new emperor wanted to celebrate his father in the grandest way possible, he built the most impressive mausoleum that China had ever seen. He invited thousands of the best craftsmen from all over China to come and put their skills to the test. The craftsmen put together three enormous rectangular pieces that were supposed to be used for the Ming Xiaoling mausoleum. But these enormous megalithic blocks were too big to be connected 
or even transported to the site of the actual mausoleum. And so the whole thing was a wash. The giant pieces of rock were abandoned right there at the quarry, and they've just kind of sat undisturbed for 600 years. And here's where we get to the unexplainable part. Researchers are confused because they don't think the ancient Chinese would have carved such giant blocks of stone if they hadn't thought they could transport them to the tomb of the emperor. There's just no way they wouldn't have known beforehand that the rocks would be too heavy. These stones were carved with incredible precision. Very smooth walls, no evidence of chisel marks as if they had been cut using lasers. This has caused some experts to speculate that these rocks may have had nothing to do with the mausoleum and may have been an abandoned project by somebody with some serious technology. And in another weird coincidence, one of the largest stones at the Yangshan Quarry supposedly points directly at Teotihuacan on the other side of the world like a big gray arrow. The Mystery of the Celtic Wood On October 9, 1917, 85 Australian soldiers marched into a Celtic wood in Belgium's West Flanders. Almost none of them came back out, and to this day, nobody knows exactly what happened inside that forest. It was here in Belgium where some of the worst combat in World War I took place. The landscape had been torn apart by shelling, the fertile fields had been reduced to a scorched wasteland, and in October the rain had turned the place into a muddy swamp. The Australian men of the 10th Battalion were selected to go into the forest and perform a raid on the German position. Those 85 soldiers marched into the fog of the forest, and only 14 came back. According to Charles Bean, an Australian historian who wrote about the war in 1917, those 70 Australian soldiers were never found. They went into the forest expecting to take on the Germans, but were seemingly swallowed by the mist and evaporated. They weren't taken as prisoners, their bodies were never found, and their 14 surviving comrades couldn't explain what happened after they walked into the woods. Some say the soldiers were massacred and their bodies disposed of. However, there is no record of it, not even from German sources. As far as we know, those men never even made it to the Germans. It's one of the biggest mysteries of World War I. If the bones of the missing men of the 10th Battalion do show up, they would not only offer a huge missing piece of the puzzle, but it will also give their souls some much-deserved rest. Floating Shiva Temple 900 years ago, the kings of the Palampet area of Warangal in what is modern India commissioned the construction of what was to be a truly inspiring temple. This became the Ramapa Stapathi, one of the few temples in the entire south, actually named after its architect. The medieval temple was built surrounded by other smaller temples, all of them dedicated to various Hindu deities, but mostly Shiva. What's so interesting today is that the temple was made out of floating bricks. Of course, these bricks can't hover in mid-air, but what they can do is float on water. The temple was constructed using some extremely impressive technology, considering the time and place. It allegedly took 40 years to build, between 1173 and 1213 AD. The temple was built over an enormous platform of sandstone, with sand filled in underneath it as a kind of shock absorber in the case of an earthquake. The bricks themselves were made of clay mixed with acacia wood and a type of fruit called myrobalan, which gave them a lower density than water. But it doesn't end there. The builders also employed special granite pillars on the outside that reflect light into the inner sanctum keeping it bright inside all day, no matter where the sun is. It's a unique temple because of this advanced technology, and nobody is exactly sure how they came up with it, especially the floating bricks. The Herxheim Ritual Site The Herxheim archaeological site in Germany has been picked apart since the 1990s. Despite that, scientists don't know exactly what to make of it. A considerable number of human skeletons were found here, and not a single one of them was ordinary. At least 500 human remains have been discovered, each one with proof of a deformity or broken in some mysterious way. These weren't normal burials, and experts believe there could be over 1,000 individuals inside the ground here who have yet to be found. It's mind-boggling because so many bodies couldn't have possibly come from these small villages in the area. 
This site is at least 7,000 years old. Settlements in this region were tiny, maybe with a dozen families each. And yet hundreds of victims were thrown into this pit, all of them with evidence that they had been gruesomely butchered. Archaeologists aren't sure what to think, but they do have one rather disturbing theory. Scientists say the villagers here may have practiced cannibalism, and that the dead people in the pit were prisoners, slaves, or abducted from outside their villages. They were then brought to Herxheim, ritually sacrificed, and then consumed in bloody ceremonies. This hypothesis comes from the fact that many of the skeletons show the exact same markings as animals that were butchered to be eaten. But of course, this is just a theory right now, and scientists don't know for sure the extent of carnage that happened here. The Robot God 2,000 years ago in Greek mythology, there was an extremely odd story about a robot god named Talos. According to legends, Talos was an automaton, an artificial life form with advanced intelligence crafted by Zeus himself from Mount Olympus. Zeus was helped by the god of the forge, Hephaestus, and together they made a construct of bronze. This living machine had a single vein that ran from his neck all the way down to his ankles and kept him alive using a special liquid metal for lifeblood. Upon each ankle was a special bolt that prevented this miraculous liquid from leaking out and causing the destruction of the great automaton. This is fascinating for a lot of reasons. The robot god was mentioned first around 700 BC. That's about 2,700 years ago. And in the years that followed, he actually became pretty popular. Talos can be found on coins, in ancient paintings, and even portrayed with an enormous set of wings, like some kind of big bronze angel. Most historians agree that Talos was the invention of some extremely creative writer in Greece, but some wonder if the idea wasn't rooted more firmly in reality. What I mean is that Talos sounds an awful lot like a real machine. A bronze outside coating, hydraulic hoses running from his head to his toes, supplying his systems with oil. It's almost as if the Greeks actually happened upon some big mechanical man, perhaps brought down from the heavens by visitors from outer space. But since they didn't know exactly what to make of a mechanical being almost 3,000 years ago, they simply described him as a mythical deity, and he faded into the obscurity of legend. What do you think? Castilly Henge A very rare stone circle has just been discovered in England a prehistoric henge in Cornwall that had somehow gone unnoticed until last year. It's being called Castilly Henge, and it's very strange because it's shaped like a horseshoe instead of a circle like most henges. In 2021, overgrown vegetation was removed from the site to reveal the imprint of where this impressive monument had once stood. There isn't any evidence of it left except the marks on the ground looking like an enormous horse had left its footprint there. Researchers had to use ground-penetrating radar to bring the site back to life, discovering the seven points where its megalithic stones would have been standing thousands of years ago. The horseshoe-shaped henge is 225 feet long and about 205 feet wide. That's around half the size of a soccer field. British researchers believe it was created around the year 2700 BC around the time the inhabitants of the island had just figured out how to farm grains. Sadly, the henge is just as mysterious as the hundreds of others scattered across Britain and Ireland. It was probably used for some kind of ritual, but then again, it might have been an ancient observatory. It's a genuine mystery, especially since all the enormous stones that once composed the structure are nowhere to be seen. They're just gone as if they'd never been there at all. What happened to the Three Brothers Jewel? One of the most enduring mysteries from medieval Europe has to do with a very rare and precious jewel. It's called the Three Brothers Jewel, and its earliest mention in history dates back to 1419. The jewel consisted of three massive pearls in a pyramid shape, each one carved in a large rectangle. There were also four other circular pearls attached to the jewel, making it a truly impressive artifact. We know that in 1467, this jewel was inherited by Charles the Bold, the last Duke of Burgundy. He carried the jewel with him up until he was defeated by the Swiss at the Battle of Grandson in 1476. According to legend, his precious talisman was stolen from his tent in the middle of the night, then made its way to the Magistrate of Bern. 
In 1504, the jewel was sold. It was sold again to King Henry VIII, passed to his successor Edward VI, and then finally stashed in the royal treasury for safekeeping. The jewel was taken from the treasury in 1554 and given to Mary I when she married Philip II of Spain. Basically, this thing jumped from one English monarch to the next. It was worn by Elizabeth I in 1585 and wound up in the Tower of London in 1623. By 1626, it was in the Netherlands and shortly after pawned in Rotterdam. And that was where the saga of this mysterious jewel ended. After 1650, it was never seen again. After 200 years of being worn by the kings and queens of England, it was gone. To this day, nobody knows where the beautiful jewel is. Giant Stone Balls Almost 100 feet beneath a coal mine, 10 spheres were discovered about half the size of an ordinary person. Each one is about 3 feet in diameter, perfectly smooth, and may change color when it rains. The bizarre spheres were unearthed by an excavator at the coal mine in Russia, all lying close together. It was almost as if the mysterious balls of stone had been buried in prehistoric times, then discovered purely by accident. When the balls were first found, there were a lot of wild theories spinning around. Some thought they were dinosaur eggs. Some believed they were made by a lost civilization thousands or millions of years ago, and others believed they had been planted underground by aliens. But as it turns out, these stones are probably naturally formed, almost certainly from a process very similar to how pearls are made. According to Olga Yakunina from the Geology Museum of Central Siberia, these stone balls are really concretions. They formed in sedimentary rocks through the process of materials cementing around a nucleus. Something organic, like a leaf or an ancient tooth, started as the nucleus of the stone. And then, over millions of years, water flowing over the nucleus deposited minerals that all got glued together. This went on until the material was shaped into a gigantic ball of solid rock. In the end, it didn't turn out to be very mysterious at all. As for the fact that the balls change color after rain, experts say that's due to their iron oxide composition, turning them into rust. The Tablets of Easter Island The Rongo Rongo tablets of Easter Island have never been deciphered. The tablets were inscribed in the native language of the island's inhabitants over 1,000 years ago. Each mysterious tablet contains glyphs carved into the wood, strange glyphs that don't appear to make any sense. They almost certainly tell a story, probably one of extreme importance, yet nobody can figure out what they say. The oral tradition of the island, legend passed down from generation to generation, tells of the king who arrived on Easter Island and had 67 wood tablets inscribed with all of the wisdom of his people. Everything from astronomy to how to sail the seven seas, it was all written down on these tablets. And then, the tablets were entrusted to the tribal leaders to keep them safe. The tribal leaders did just that, and many of the tablets have been preserved on the island ever since. There are currently 27 still surviving of the original 67, although many have been stolen and are now scattered throughout the world in various museums. What's truly bizarre is that nowhere else in Polynesia has the Rongo Rongo script been found. The glyphs on the tablets are 100% unique to Easter Island. This has made them even more difficult to decipher and almost impossible to track their origin. As of right now, scientists are still baffled and it doesn't look like the Rongo Rongo script will ever be deciphered. Mysterious Ancient Toys Tel Jameh is an ancient Assyrian settlement in modern Israel that was inhabited 3,800 years ago. Over the past two decades, archaeologist Gus Van Beek has been excavating the site and recovering mysterious objects. These objects range from old coins to scarab amulets, scraps of pottery, and baffling ancient toys. One of the strangest collections of objects found consisted of 17 small disks some made from chalk and others made from stone, with two holes drilled in the center. Similar objects have been found in Japan, Egypt, and even the Americas. Three of them were found in New York City at the old site of a British army camp. One of them was made from a coin, while others found across the world were made from stones 4,000 years ago. Scientists can't agree on what these mysterious artifacts were used for. Some say they were buttons, others say they were weights for looms, and others simply call them miscellaneous objects. But according to Gus Van Beek, they may have been children's toys. 
He thinks thread would have been strung through the holes and then stretched, allowing the discs to spin. They would have been pretty rudimentary toys, but may have made a kind of buzzing sound that ancient people found amusing. Yas Atash Behram and the Eternal Flame Yas Atash Behram is one of the most mysterious temples in the entire world. It can be found in Yazd, Iran, and contains a magical treasure that's been around for 1,500 years. The temple was not dedicated to the Christian god, it wasn't made by Islamists, and it has nothing to do with the Jewish people. It's a Zoroastrian fire temple, the only one still standing outside of India. It contains a flame that has been burning since the year 470 AD. That was during the reign of the extremely powerful Sasanian Empire. The flame flickered to life inside the Pars Karyan fire temple, was relocated to the ancient city of Akta, where it continued burning for 700 years. Throughout the ages, as wars came and went, and civilizations rose and fell, the fire continued to be protected by the keepers of the Zoroastrian temples. It finally landed in its current home at Yaz Atash Peram in 1934. These days, the sacred flame is more of a tourist attraction than anything. It's burning inside an ancient bronze vessel and hidden on the other side of a glass wall. A person called a hirab has the important job of keeping the flame lit. Several times a day, the hirab must feed the flame dry wood to keep it alive. Only those who practice Zoroastrianism may witness the flame burning for themselves. Zoroastrianism is believed to be one of the earliest monotheistic faiths in the world, starting in Persia 4,000 years ago. It's older than Christianity by thousands of years and still practiced today. However, there are only between 100,000 and 200,000 worshippers across the world, mainly in Iran and India. The Tucson Artifacts In 1924, a man named Charles Manier discovered 31 lead objects. They were found near Picture Rocks in Arizona and were initially believed to be relics from an ancient Mediterranean civilization. The artifacts were shaped to look like crosses, swords, and other religious objects. Some of them had Latin inscriptions, some had Hebrew, and one even had a portrait of a dinosaur on it. There were random Roman numerals engraved on the lead artifacts, and it was all very strange. To make things even more mysterious, Charles didn't find any other artifacts or signs of civilization. He found nothing except the lead objects. There was no hint that humans had ever lived in this dusty patch of Arizona. In the 1920s, the discovery of the Tucson artifacts was a revelation. The objects were believed to be proof that a Roman colony of Judeo-Christians had crossed the ocean and settled in Arizona around the year 790 AD. It was sensational. A man named Thomas Bent was so eager to discover more artifacts that he moved to the excavation site and built his house there to legally claim the property. But then came the bad news. Harvard University scholar George Valiant publicly denounced the artifacts as fake. So did Neil Judd from the National Museum at the Smithsonian Institution. Neil said the artifacts were created by an incompetent individual with a flair for Latin and a fascination with antiquity. These days, the artifacts are widely accepted as fakes. There probably was no Roman colony in Arizona. Nevertheless, there are believers who think the Smithsonian covered up the discovery so they wouldn't have to change the history books. So I wanted to give a big shout out to Alicia Ziglar and Candace Perry. Thanks so much for watching and spending time with us. If you are new here, welcome! And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. The Glossal Artifacts in Glossel, France in 1924, a cavern was discovered filled to the brim with artifacts. Oddly enough, this was the exact same year Charles Manier found the Tucson artifacts. It was a good year for archaeology and for mysterious potential forgeries. A farmer was plowing his fields in France when he came across the cavern. From within the dark and creepy space, he retrieved over 3,000 artifacts. It took six years to excavate them all, and much like the Tucson artifacts, they were greeted with great skepticism. Experts to this day debate the authenticity of the artifacts, and they've never been universally accepted or positively debunked. The thing about the artifacts in France is that they were found completely by accident by a 17-year-old farmer named Émile Fradin. In 1924, the 17-year-old farmer who had to work 20 hours a day didn't have time for cooking up schemes, never mind hand-crafting archaeological forgeries. 
He discovered the underground chamber by accident and was shocked to see it filled with ceramic pieces of pots, human bones, and a tiled floor. In typical 1920s fashion, archaeologists went to the cave and ripped it up piece by piece. They took out the walls, the floor, and carried it all back to their museum labs. The artifacts were dated back to between 100 and 400 AD. Then, during excavations that followed, additional artifacts were found dating back to 10,200 BC. The discoveries became so controversial mainly because they were so strange. For example, there were weird tablets etched in indecipherable script and clay pots with inhuman faces on them. Some experts declared everything inside the cave real, while other experts said everything was fake. Nobody could agree on which artifacts were real and which artifacts were hoaxes. Adding to the mystery, there was a modern excavation in 1983, but the summary was never published. In 1995, more research was done, and the artifacts were dated back to the year 500. The Cursed Sapphire The Gem of Sorrow, also known as the Delphi Purple Sapphire, is a mysterious haunted artifact which allegedly brings great misfortune to those who possess it. The stone was supposedly stolen by a British soldier during the mutiny of 1857 in Kanpur, India. During the fighting and the chaos, the soldier crept into the sacred temple of Indra, stole the gemstone that had been there for time unknown, and then fled. His name was Colonel W. Ferris, and he took the gigantic purple sapphire back home to England. Then came the troubles. He fell into financial ruin. Every member of his family came down with a mysterious illness, and his life was utterly ruined. Following the ruination of the colonel, the stone fell into the hands of Edward Heron Allen in 1890. Almost immediately after he came into possession of the gem, he became the victim of a series of strange and unfortunate events. In 1902, he gave the stone to a friend, and his luck changed. But his friend then fell into despair just like all the others. The pattern of misfortune continued until Heron Allen's daughter sent the gem to the Natural History Museum. It stayed there until 1972, hidden in a drawer, until curator Peter Tandy came across it. The gem came with a letter, which said that whoever took possession of the stone should throw it into the sea. Ever since, the mysterious purple sapphire has been on display at London's Natural History Museum in their vault collection. The museum display seems to have finally broken the curse. The Garuda Bell The Garuda Bell was found in 1944 by a young boy named Newton Anderson in West Virginia. According to legend, Newton found the mysterious bell inside a lump of coal. He dropped the coal, it broke, and he pried the treasure out from inside. It was like a chocolate egg with a prize in it. The bell is made of brass, about 7 inches tall, and it's mounted at its top by a figure of Garuda, a huge bird from Hindu mythology. But there are two things seriously wrong with the artifact. First of all, how an artifact from ancient India made its way into West Virginia is a little confusing. Second, the lump of coal was mined from a seam estimated to be 300 million years old. None of this makes any sense. Some believe the bell is a legitimate antediluvian artifact something from a lost race of intelligent beings who lived on the planet millions of years ago. The Fisher Canyon Shoe Print The Fisher Canyon shoe print was discovered in Nevada in 1917 by a miner named Albert Knapp. He brought it to the attention of his mining engineer, who couldn't believe what he was seeing. The print was solidified in a coal seam, a chunk of hard material dated to the Triassic period of between 252 and 201 million years ago. Somehow, a modern shoe made its imprint in a coal seam older than the dinosaurs. At least that's what it looked like to the miners. In truth, it really does look like a shoe print. There's no denying the uncanniness of the print. However, archaeologists and geologists alike were quick to dismiss the discovery. They said that all kinds of strange shapes can turn up in ironstone, including a shoe print. The lack of additional prints suggests it was nothing but a natural phenomenon and a really strange coincidence. Creating a Forgery Mysterious artifacts from the early 20th century turn up all the time, and scientists couldn't always explain them. But in the 21st century, scientists are pretty good at spotting forgeries from a mile away. 
when the archaeologist Eliseo Gil revealed a small trove of Roman artifacts, including a depiction of the crucifixion, Egyptian hieroglyphics, and one of the earliest uses of the Basque language, scientists were skeptical. Eliseo and two of his colleagues claimed to have found their artifacts in the Roman ruins of Iruna Velea. They also claimed the graffiti they found on an ancient piece of pottery was the earliest known picture of Jesus Christ being crucified. In February of 2020, these archaeologists found themselves in a criminal trial accused of forging the mysterious artifacts. After the relics were shown to the world, other archaeologists were quick to point out inconsistencies. The graffiti had been made using modern language, even commas and words from hundreds of years later. The wording was all wrong, sparking immediate concern. The archaeologists also forged hieroglyphics spelling out the name of Queen Nefertiti, who would have been unknown to the Basque people of Spain. A scientific commission ruled that 476 of the artifacts were either manipulated or simply not real at all. Eliseo and his colleagues were shunned by the archaeological community and disgraced. Scientists couldn't understand their discoveries because none of them had been real. Now the archaeologists are looking at upwards of five years in prison. The Return of the Loch Ness Monster The Loch Ness Monster has haunted the Scottish lake for centuries. The most famous photograph of the Loch Ness Monster ever taken has generally been considered a hoax. That is, until now. Scientists are now saying that the picture of the Loch Ness Monster sticking its head out of the lake might actually be real, showing the elusive beast in all of its glory. The scientists determined that if the picture is real, chances are that Nessie isn't a monster at all, but a gigantic eel that was photographed. The team of scientists from New Zealand University of Otago recently took DNA samples from Loch Ness to see what kind of creature was really living in the lake. They took approximately 250 water samples from various locations and depths, then combed through the lingering DNA to discover about 3,000 distinct species of animals. The good news is, they don't need to capture all of the creatures that are out there. They just need to get the water that has been in close proximity to them. Most of them are small, so small they are practically invisible. But according to Neil Gemmel, they also found evidence of a gigantic eel living in the lake. It could be a big eel or even a family of big eels, and people have been mistaking them for actual monsters. Ordinary eels grow to be about six feet long, which would mean the eels living in Loch Ness are some kind of unknown giant breed. Most people who see the monster describe it as being at least 10 or 15 feet long, sometimes even longer. That could mean that the lake has some of the biggest undiscovered freshwater eels in the world. It still hasn't been confirmed, but it is one of the more compelling theories that explain the mystery of the Loch Ness Monster. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. The Maryland Cryptid Museum there is a very strange story that involves the basement of a mansion, an eccentric archaeologist, and a lot of specimens and boxes. As far as the story goes, a man by the name of Thomas Theodore Marilyn died in the 1960s. After he passed, a small collection of unbelievable oddities and fantastic creatures was discovered in the basement of his mansion. He had preserved mermaids, gnomes, baby dragons, aliens, vampires, fairies, and even demonic pharaohs from Egypt. The specimens in the boxes are partly skeletal, some with their original tissue, and some still preserved with fur or feathers. There are many bizarre creatures in this collection, things like mummified werewolves and rotting dinosaurs. None of the specimens have been officially examined by any kind of biologist or scientist, and a lot of the pieces are so outrageous, it makes you wonder just who exactly was Thomas Theodore Marilyn, and where did he get the tiny mummified remains of a creature titled Menace, Vampire King of Egypt, the Demon Child Pharaoh? What was he doing hoarding all of these oddities in his basement? In the end, these things are wild and outrageous because they were designed to be that way by an artist named Alex C.F. He created the specimens to showcase his curious talents in creativity and taxidermy, as well as his ghoulish imagination. By combining bits and pieces of real animals, he could help shine a light on what many of these cryptid monsters could actually look like. The West Branch Dugong in Pennsylvania, there is a landscape called the Susquehanna Greenway. It's full of colorful, pristine wilderness, bubbling rivers, 
and it is steeped in rich culture and history. It's a place where families go biking, hiking, and canoeing. It's also shrouded in mystery, as the locals say a creature lurks just out of sight. The creature has many different names, from the West Branch Dugong to the Susquehanna Seal, and even the Kettle Creek Monster. But whichever name you want to call it, it's all the same creature. It's a marine monster that was seen repeatedly by people in the area over 100 years ago. Take the article from the Daily Democrat newspaper on February 27, 1897. The article described how the creature had been living in the valley before it was ever settled by Europeans. Then, when the Europeans showed up, it settled between Lock Haven and Kettle Creek and it occasionally capsized lumber rafts and maybe even killed people. It was described as being the size of a hippopotamus, yet not born from the imagination of any living person on Earth. It was so horrible that it could give you nightmares, and it often kept forestry workers up at night with its incessant howling and thrashing. However, reports of the creature dwindled as the decades went on, and by the late 1900s, many people believed the creature had either escaped back to the ocean or simply died. That being said, creepy things have been witnessed in the waters of the Susquehanna River as recently as the year 2000. That was when outdoor guide and writer Ken Marrer he saw a huge creature swimming in the river, something that looked like a submarine about to surface. Whatever it was, it was absolutely enormous and pushed up a huge wake of water as it came toward Ken. But just before it revealed itself, the monster sank back under the surface and vanished. Human-headed creature. On a beach in England, a gigantic sea creature washed ashore. The monster was 48 feet long, had a hard shell attached to its back, and a head that looked human. It was discovered on the sandy shores of Porthleven Beach back on September 14, 1786. This is an older discovery, but there are plenty of historical records. According to the reports of the day, it all happened during a particularly violent storm. The wind was howling, the waves were huge and violent, the coastal villagers hid and trembled in their houses. Then, when the storm finally settled, something had been left behind. It was the size of an ordinary whale, first found by a pair of boys who were looking for shipwrecks on the beach. The boys soon gathered up some adults, and the villagers crowded around the beached monster not knowing what to do or what it was. All of these details were put into the Hereford Journal in October of 1786. Back in the 18th century, people were still extremely superstitious and fast to believe in monsters. The general consensus was that the thing that washed up was a gigantic mermaid or a biblical beast. There were some rational villagers who thought it was just a beached whale, but they were the minority. In the end, the villagers stabbed and beat the thing until it was extremely dead, and that way they could truly examine it. The creature had a large head with human-like features, a flat nose, and a large mouth. It had greenish, intelligent eyes, and on its back was a hard shell like an oblong turtle shell. Its forefeet were short and looked more like monkey paws, but it also had fins that helped it swim. It looked like a hybrid mutant, and nothing else like it has ever been seen on the shores of England again. Mississippi Troll in Mississippi, someone took a photo of something that they believe is a real-life troll. The picture was taken in a swampy area beside a river, showing a small humanoid being just kind of loitering in the water. The photographer was on the dock beside their family houseboat and was looking across the low tide and into the forest on the other side of the water. And that was when they saw the creature emerge from the trees, approach the river, and begin to drink. According to what the photographer said happened, they went to get a pair of binoculars to watch the creature from a safe distance. It had weird pink skin, bulging and unnatural eyes, and floppy ears and horns. It looked to them exactly like a troll. But this isn't where the story ends. The person who took the picture went on to describe their life living on a houseboat in the Mississippi swamp. They said that anyone who ever visited their houseboat got the weird feeling that they were being watched and that it wasn't unusual to hear the sound of screaming in the trees at night. This person believes that Mississippi is home to a mysterious race of little trolls and that they hide in the swamps and are basically impossible to find. The Dog Man 
Yet another bizarre unidentified creature was seen recently in the United States, this time by a riverside in Texas. A fisherman spotted the creature with his camera, which he described as a half-man, half-dog monster. He was able to record a bit of it on video, but the issue is that the footage is incredibly grainy and looks like an old recording of Bigfoot from the 1990s. The footage was shot near San Benito, and honestly, whatever the creature is, it does kind of look like Bigfoot. It can be seen padding along the banks of the river just like a dog or a wolf, but then it suddenly gets off its four legs and stands up to be the height of a grizzly bear. It becomes huge when it stands and looks like it has a body of shaggy hair, just like Sasquatch. Nobody has been able to confirm the creature's identity. It's most likely not a dog-man hybrid, but it could have potentially been some sort of Texas Bigfoot. According to some more scientific minds, the creature was just a really big monkey. Seeing as how many wild animal zoos there are in Texas, that's not entirely out of the question either. The Brosno Dragon The Brosno Dragon is a strange monster that supposedly lives deep in the Russian wilderness. Its existence has never been confirmed, but it's still a realistic and terrifying entity to the people of rural Russia. Some believe the creature is a mutant beaver. Some say it's a giant pike that's been growing for over 150 years. And others say it's nothing at all but a fantasy. This is one of the weirder cases in that scientists may have actually come up with a logical explanation for the Brosno dragon. Because the beast is said to lurk in Lake Brosno, it could be nothing but random bursts of gas in the shape of a dragon. Basically, when hydrogen sulfide bubbles up from the bottom of the lake, it bursts through the surface of the water and kind of resembles a dragon's head. There is a theory that says the lake is inside of a sleeping volcanic crater and that a fissure at the bottom is responsible for leaking the gas, kind of like a burst gas line in a basement. But then again, it could be a real monster. The legends go all the way back to the 13th century, and people as recently as World War II claimed that a German airplane was swallowed whole by something massive in the lake. The Aya Napa Sea Monster The Aya Napa Sea Monster supposedly lives off the coast of Cyprus in the Mediterranean Sea. Local fishermen call it the Tofilico Teras, or the friendly monster. This is because there haven't been any reports of the monster breaking ships or hurting people. However, some fishermen do claim the creature rises from the depths to drag away their fishing nets. Like many strange mythical beasts of the sea, the Aya Napa monster has been witnessed countless times. Newspapers call it the Loch Ness Monster of Cyprus, although nobody is entirely sure what it is. Some say it looks like a crocodile, while others say it's really a giant serpent. Sadly, there isn't actually any evidence that the creature exists. No one has ever been able to take a decent photograph of it, and the government of Cyprus is unwilling to identify it as a hoax because they make too much money from tourists. People from all over Europe come to Ayanapa just to rent boats and spend their days looking for the monster. The Pale Creep An unbelievable video recently appeared online. The video shows a very strange creature moving around some parked cars in the middle of the night. It's as pale as a ghost and kind of looks like a pasty white Neanderthal that accidentally tunneled its way to the surface and got lost. According to the caption in the video, the creature was caught on a security camera near Moorhead, Kentucky back in July of 2022. We still have no answers as to what the pale creature was that stalked Moorhead in the middle of the night. Some say it was just a hoax dreamt up by someone to get likes online. Others think it was a Kentucky ghoul and that it probably retreated back to the forest and will never be seen again. And honestly, if the footage is 100% real, it's impossible to say what the thing was. It was definitely humanoid in nature and could as easily have been a person in white spandex as a ghost. Ugly Deep Sea Creature An unknown creature was just caught in deep waters off the coast of southern Australia. The fisherman who caught it described the creature as the ugliest thing he'd ever seen. The man who had the unfortunate privilege of hooking this fish is Jason Moyce. He's a popular fisherman on social media and always shows the amazing things he reels in off the coast of Bermagui, about 240 miles from Sydney. But this time, he was truly stumped. He shared a picture of the hideous, mottled, pinkish-black thing online to see if anyone could help him identify it. 
Jason and the captain had been fishing their whole lives and didn't have a clue what it was. Some people compared it to the Stranger Things monster from the Upside Down, but it could just be a blobfish. The blobfish has already been declared the ugliest fish in the world, so it wouldn't be a far stretch. However, as far as we know, this one was a truly unidentified creature, a thing pulled from over 1,700 feet deep, where the sun barely shines. Thanks for watching! What's the craziest monster that you think might actually be real? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you soon! Bye!